Charles, you are the wind beneath my wings. Oh, thank you, darling. Oh, thank you. I am not the technical one here. I know. I freely admit that. You know, we come up with these ideas and you make them happen. Hmm. Like, how did this come about? Believe it or not, it's all because of Anchor. Anchor has the tools. It lets me record, edit, and distribute right from the computer. Sometimes I do it from my phone. It's just as easy either way. Wow. Yeah. We're on like dozens of platforms, though. It's true. Anchor makes it easy to distribute our podcast on platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and dozens more. It's everything we need, and it's all in one place. And you'll love this part. It's all completely free. Oh, thank God. (laughs) Right. I use Anchor for pretty much every aspect of getting our show out there and into the listeners' ears. That's amazing. It is. And if you, dear listeners, want to get into the podcasting game, you just need to download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Maybe Anchor's the wind beneath my wings. Hey! Coming to you from the dining room table at East Barbary Lane, welcome to a very special edition of Full Circle, the podcast. I'm your host, Charles Tyson Jr. And I am Martha Madrigal. We have a very special guest today. She's a personal shero of mine. Julia Serrano is with us. She is best known for her book, Whipping Girl, a transsexual woman on sexism and the scapegoating of femininity. This is a book that helped me to view myself as a trans person, femininity, gender, sexism, just put all of it into, you know, a a whole new context. And she gave me language I didn't have before that. Uh, NPR has called the book a foundational text for anyone hoping to understand transgender politics and culture in the U.S. today, particularly as experienced and shaped by trans women. Ms. Ms. Magazine also called that book number 16 on the 100 best nonfiction books of all times. Uh, I'm not going to, I, I can't take the time to read all of the places she has been published or all of the other books she has published, but you can learn a whole lot more on juliaserrano.com. Uh, I want to say that she is also an accomplished spoken word artist, a musician, and a slam poetry champion. Julia has a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biophysics from Columbia University and spent 17 years as a researcher at UC Berkeley in the fields of genetics, evolution, and developmental biology. She is one of the foremost voices um, as we talk about the trans community, in my opinion and in my estimation, and I owe her a, a personal debt of gratitude. Please welcome Julia Serrano to the Full Circle Table. Hi. Hi. Hi, Julia. Hello. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. We are thrilled. We are thrilled. Um, you know, I, I told you a little story. Um, I'm just going to repeat now that we're recording. Um, my very first trans mentor was a woman named Dawn Monroe. She was a Scottish biologist uh, at the University of Pennsylvania until she retired. And she was a very no-nonsense trans woman who we all knew and we all adored. And she commanded me, because Dawn never asked you to do anything. She told you what you you needed to do next. Mm -hmm. And she said, you need to get yourself a copy of Whipping Girl. And I did. And I've never been more thankful. Um, It really helped me put a lot into perspective when I was trying to find myself. And I just have to thank you for that. Well, thank you again, Thank you for the kind words, and um, I'm happy that anytime anyone ever says that my writings have helped them or or um, been important to them, I really appreciate it. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, I also follow you on Medium. I write there too, not with the same audience, um, and that's how I found out about the new book, Sexed Up. Um, I just finished reading it today. I was determined I was going to get cover to cover (laughs) before we sat down, and I did, and I'm so glad that I did. It's such a beautiful extension of your work, um, and it's so important. Um, I retermed it, Everybody Relax, (laughs) because I I really feel like that would be a great uh, sub name for the book. Everybody Relax. (laughs) 
Mm. Yeah, I I've, of course um, authors you... don't really get to name their books or their subtitles, but yeah, if, if I could go back in time and I had that power, I would definitely consider that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what shows you, your writing is so lucid and it's also so often contemporary, as I said, because I do um, read a lot of what you write on a regular basis. Um, to hone in where you did to, to really talk about um, the sexualization of, of so many of us. What what um, what led to that? What made you decide this was the next book? Yeah, this is something that's been brewing for a while. Um, in fact, in Whipping Girl, I talk about the ways in which um, trans people and especially trans women are sexualized in our culture. And uh, there's even a chapter in that book called Transsexualization. Um, and some of the early ideas, I, I talk a bit in that book about, um, in that chapter, about the predator-prey mindset, which comes up a lot in um, Sexed Up, the new book. And particularly in Whipping Girl, I was trying to explain a lot of my experiences and other people's experiences with regards to, you know, how people view trans people and trans women and trans feminine spectrum people. And sexualization was definitely a really big part of it. And I think in Whipping Girl, I did a good, um, like, first pass on trying to understand why it is that people project a lot of sexual messages on people on the trans female trans feminine spectrum specifically in a world where yeah. like women are viewed as sexual objects um there's this tendency to assume that there must be sexual motives behind why anyone uh, would want to become female or become feminine so that was a big part of Whipping Girl. But as, as I wrote it, but then especially afterwards, um, I realized that a lot of the different ways that I was sexualized as a trans woman, um, for instance, a lot of times people would assume that I must be um, sexually deviant or predatory or um, promiscuous or desperate or that I must be a fetish object. All these different ideas were things that I saw cropping up as I would read um, and talk to friends of mine who are marginalized in in ways besides or in addition to being trans. And so this is something that has been like I've been kind of working on uh, gradually over a long period of time. I initially pitched it to my publisher in 2019. Um, and I started working on the book um, at the very end of 2019, going into 2020. Um, and so that's kind of how it evolved. And I should also mention that another aspect of it that was important for my thinking is that when I transitioned and I had an experience that a lot of trans women have or people... Um, people who are on the trans feminine spectrum or generally where the ways that I experienced moving through the world when people perceived me as male were very different from what I experienced once people started reading me as female and especially a lot mm -hmm. of sexual harassment and objectification and all that sort of stuff. And I found feminist writings about those experiences to be really, really helpful to make sense of my experiences being sexualized as a woman. However, they often didn't really say anything to all these other ways in which I'm sexualized when people know that I'm trans or the way that other marginalized groups are sexualized. So I really, and to me, they felt the same. Like I, I feel that if um, I've had experiences where people assuming I'm a cis woman called me a slut or, um, or attempted to like mm. rope me or whatever. Like these are the types of sexualization that um, cisgender women experience all the time. But if people knowing that I'm a trans woman call me a pervert or attempt to grope me, which has happened upon people finding out that I'm trans, those experiences felt the same to me. They felt very interconnected. And I, I wanted to try to find explanations that would explain all of them rather than having um, each and every group kind of have completely entirely separate conversations about the sexualization they experience. Cause I 
definitely believe, and I try to make the case that they're all connected. Hmm. Yeah, I, I re- I'm currently reading Whooping Girl, and there was a point that you made that I kind of knew, but seeing it laid out, I was like, damn. Um, in the scenarios of trans women when they are going through transition, um, under the the supervision of the uh, of the the medical professionals, basically you're only successfully a woman if you can be an object of sexual desire to the male. And I was like, eh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you're you're only unless you can be commodified, you're not worth anything. It's like, ugh. yeah, yeah, ugh. and that was and really this, it, get. Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to add, um, obviously, <laughs> with uh, kind of gatekeeping or medical professionals deciding whether or not a person is really trans or should transition, that is still not perfect right. yet. There are a lot of problems with it. But but very explicitly in the writings of uh, kind of trans health professionals during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, there is a lot of very explicit we're judging these women based upon whether they could go out in the real world and look like an attractive young lady. Like, like they pretty much said that. And, um, a lot of the judging, even when I transitioned, um, which was like 2001, I was on, you know, we had no social media then, but we did have (laughs) e-groups, um, like email lists that you Mm. could be on. And so there were a lot of, trans related email list that I was on. And I was lucky enough that I transitioned in a major city that I was easily able to find a therapist who was knowledgeable about trans people and not pathologizing. Um, But the the list that I was on, it was people all over the US, and perhaps even other countries, I don't recall specifically. But a lot of the people were telling me that, oh, well, I went into the office of this therapist. And they immediately said, I must not be trans. And they're like, why? And they're like, well, you came in here wearing jeans and a t-shirt. It's like, yeah, I know, because like, I'm, I'm navigating the world as male right now, but I understand myself to be female and I want to transition, but I haven't done that yet. And like, just even a lot of therapists insisting on you have to come dressed up head to toe and makeup and and feminine dress and everything which is totally fine if that's what you want to do but shouldn't be a requirement to like be a woman because it's not a requirement for women in most settings right. to like have to to do all that even though it is in some settings so yeah it, you don't get to <clears throat> present for yourself you must present for the enjoyment of others otherwise well, what's the point yeah and and it's interesting because um i have a friend who transitioned in 1972 1973 and uh she she went to johns hopkins she moved down to baltimore and um was just very open about who she was she had always been and she had to fight because they said you're not our ideal candidate and a big part of that was she wasn't willing to pretend she wasn't willing to um, not talk about her surgery, not talk about who she was or completely obliterate her identity. And that made her a bad candidate. Um, the, the patients at the time in the gender clinic weren't allowed to know one another. They weren't allowed to meet, you know, and it was so, yeah. so it's interesting that you know that could be like clearly you've lived as a woman clearly you do live as a woman but not by their standards you right. know because here she was yeah kind of in jeans and a, a you know a, a, a tank top or whatever it was but it wasn't the ideal and that was a struggle yeah it was a struggle and also that idea that i'm not going to pretend this hasn't happened this is part of my experience which at the time was unheard of so yeah. I guess we've we've come so far and yet <laughs> well, and it's, you do a really good job talking about just that. Like we've come so far and yet so much is still the same. 
Yeah, specifically that that um, aspect I, of it jumped out at me that you just said, not just the oh well if you're if you're a trans woman that the expectation that you will like fulfill like a feminine uh, ideal of being you know like dresses and makeup and everything like that again which again totally fine if that's what you want to do but shouldn't be a requirement um but then you also brought up the your friend and the having to conceal who you used to be and i remember when i was reading yes. these old gatekeeper um articles and they were very explicit about like well you know like the ideal trans candidate they should move to another city if they have children they like should say goodbye to them, um, like make up some story, like make up a, a back pass for yourself and a story for people from your previous life about like why you suddenly disappeared. And so much of that is really obviously trying to having nothing to do with the trans individuals. This was about managing information about transgender people and making sure that the average cisgender person never had to come across someone who was out as transgender. That's totally what it was. Right. And it's very interesting thinking about right. it, especially given the current climate and, you know, Florida's, you know, the don't say gay bill that you're not allowed to even talk about sexual orientation or gender identity in a classroom. That's the same idea. Like, Let's make a world where the yeah. average person never has to come across a, a trans person or queer person who's out. Um, yeah. And that's cute and all, but it's a new day. You know, one of the things that you talk about in the book is courtesy stigma. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about predator and prey. I just, I just kind of want to go back to that for a minute because that phrase really stuck with me and it's so applicable to I think, you know, one of probably our our one of our most critical challenges is just you know the absolute horror of Black trans women being murdered, and mm -hmm. you know what what we do know about that is most of the time um, the the um, the person is known to the victim. They're not yeah. a stranger, and it isn't always sex work. A lot of times, it's a lover. It's someone who they're very close to. Um, and this idea of courtesy stigma, the idea, you know, that, that we kind of, what we pass on to men, I, would you talk more about what that phrase means and, and I think how it applies here? Sure. Yeah. Go. Yeah. And I'll say that, um, while I started the book, um, my interest was sexualization, but the book ended up being very intertwined with the concept of stigma, um, which. Uh, I think most of us know the word stigma gets thrown around a lot, kind of to imply shame, like, you know, I'm ashamed, I feel stigma. Um, but it's been studied for a long time by sociologists. The, the sociologist who coined the term courtesy stigma is Irvin Goffman, who was writing about stigma back in 1960. And I found his work, while very anachronistic, because his work, it was written in the early 60s. Um, was very elucidating of a lot of shared experiences that marginalized groups share. And particularly, uh, he used the term courtesy stigma to describe the idea that someone who's stigmatized for whatever reason, because you're trans, but maybe you're a person of color or you're a sex worker or you're gay, or um, there are a lot of different ways in which you can be stigmatized in our society. And when people are really heavily stigmatized, there's this idea that their stigma can spread on people who are close to them. So for instance, mm. um, like he talks a lot in the book about family members of say people with disabilities or family members who have like a gay child, um, like the stigma that they feel like it's like that rubs off on them. Um, but it definitely right. also rubs off on, you know, your, your partners, right? Um, and like from a trans perspective, I think a lot of us have the experience of at some point or another, like having, you know, relationships or dating someone who like is interested in you, but doesn't want to ever be seen in public with you or not have anyone in their life know that they want to date someone who's trans. And this isn't a trans specific thing. It can also apply to other marginalized groups. And uh, and that definitely, 
I think stigma is also very useful in thinking about intersectionality, where if you are stigmatized in one way or in multiple ways, that that sort of adds up, that um, people might feel like they need to keep their distance from you even more so. Um, whether that be someone who's interested in you or just someone in your neighborhood who like every time you walk by, they like, they run away from you. Um, so yeah, so, and I, I found this idea of stigma being contagious in, in other people's minds. I, and I definitely phrased it in terms of contagious. I don't think that Goffman specifically said that, but I, I very much think that mm -hmm. people have long assumed that, that LGBTQ people, um, as well as people of color, as well as other marginalized groups are contagious in a certain way, that if you get too close to us, it might rub off on you. Um, and you can see this arise in so many different situations, like um, the idea that sometimes if people find out that you're a queer person and they've known you for a while, they're like, well, does that make me gay? Or if I, if I found you attractive, mm. does that make me gay? Um, or you can see it in a lot of, uh, especially a lot of the U.S. history with regards um, to racism and the, the Jim Crow South. And if you look at like laws against interracial marriage um, and, you know, the so-called like the one drop rule where if you had any, you know, black or people of color, um, who are your parents or grandparents that that taints you all the way. Um, right. I, I think all yeah. these are like examples of, of the idea that if you, if you have a stigma, you're seen as contaminated. And if people get too close to you, they can become contaminated too. And that, that line of thought, I think does feed so much of, you know, what we see, we know that a lot you know, it happens throughout the queer community, but it absolutely happens throughout the trans community that there are people who will sleep with us. They'll even buy us presents, but they don't walk down the street with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, you know, that still happens. That still happens. And it was just in reading and in reading about that, I was like, this is some of the best um, analogy that I've seen for the way, because I, I've seen it in real time where you know privately this man will adore a trans woman they'll be in relationship but she's not allowed to speak of it she's not allowed to put a picture of him on social media a lot of times he has another a wife or a girlfriend or somebody and while they can have a beautiful private relationship if that if somebody else finds out suddenly the world is different and that you know that <laughs> I remember that happening in grade school. I mean, you know, like um, any of the boys that gave me attention, that was fine, but it was understood. We don't talk about that. And it, it fascinates me, but it, it all, it's also scary. And I just want, what do we do about that? Do you, do you see a, I mean, I, I think your book, the book is hopeful. The book really does take us in the right direction, but I mean, very specifically, an answer to that would it would to the men that love us but i mean my yeah. mine mine takes credit for me like you know he's <laughs> always right here um uh, but i know how rare that is yeah um that's, so that's a that's a difficult topic and i i i discuss in the book and there's particularly um one chapter that's called you make me sick which is a pun or a play on words mm -hmm. of the word sick the idea that um, not just people being disgusted, say, in this particular instance of, like, the idea of, of being attracted to a trans person, but then also um, the idea that their attraction is seen as a pathologized, like, they're seen as sick, right? And it's kind of like that stigma that by being attracted to us or partnering with us, that like our stigma kind of rubs off on that on them and that can create a lot of really complex experiences that depend on the the individuals involved so for example a lot of my experiences dating men 
who would have been horribly ashamed to be seen with me in public happened before I transitioned myself. Um, and so a lot of them where they were very private uh, relationships that we both enjoyed, but they were very private, not only because like he wouldn't want to be seen with me or have anyone know about me, but I was a closeted trans person who didn't want anyone to know that I was trans to begin with, right? So it's kind of like a shared closeting. Right. Um, and then after I transitioned um, and in dating after I transitioned, you know, I would always, and, and it would depend particularly, especially since so much of dating happens on like dating apps and such, uh, I would anytime or, and at this point, Craigslist still actually, I, there were a lot of, um, I did a lot of dating on Craigslist, which no longer does personal ads um, because of right. all the FOSTA, SESTA crap. Um, anyway, my first question to people would be like, what is your relationship to being a, in a relationship with a trans woman? Like, are you... Is, is this something that you're interested, but you don't want to be a part of your life? Just like a little private thing? Is it something that you are open about and like people can know about it? Like I, that would be, I'd be very interested in, in knowing that. And for some people who are replying, they're like, oh, I'm totally fine. Actually, I'm bisexual myself or something. It's like, oh, okay, great. We're both queer people. We're both okay with it. Um, and, and I also met straight men who, you know, I remember one of them very, like it stuck with me because it was the first time I heard someone say it. This is like a while back. Like now I've heard many people say it, but he just said, I'm attracted to women. And some of the women I've dated have been transgender and some haven't. And I was like, okay, right answer. Yay. Um, right. Exactly. Yeah. I, I definitely think the promising part is that these are all things that we have learned through being socialized in our culture with all of its hierarchies, but it's also something we can unlearn. So in the same way that I um, used to be horribly, I used to be horribly ashamed of the fact that I was transgender and I hid it for many years. Um, and now I'm like totally comfortable being out as transgender and I don't have any issues with it. I think that that's true of people um, who are our partners or potential partners and that I think somebody who maybe right now is ashamed that they're attracted to trans people will eventually right. they'll evolve to kind of in the same way that I'll evolve and um, maybe they will kind of get beyond that stigma too. Um, the difference is the big difference is that if you're the trans person, like you can't completely get out of the stigma. Like it's always with you. Like, even though I'm totally out and totally, proud of being trans like i have to deal with that stigma all the time so i definitely think that sometimes people and this is true this isn't just a trans thing this is true for all marginalized people you can be partnered with somebody um and uh face some of that stigma but then if you're no longer partnered with them you don't necessarily face that anymore so it's it's very tricky and I, I find that that in talking to a lot of people about relationships and marginalization and stigma, whether trans or otherwise, that I think it's just complex and I think every relationship is a little bit different. But I definitely do think that we are a, we are capable of unlearning um, stigma and overcoming that. So that's the promising part. And the question is, the harder part is how to get any individual to understand that and to make that same journey on their own of, of moving beyond or transcending stigma. Um, yeah, you and I are the same age. We're close in age. Okay. You're actually a little bit younger than I am. But <clears throat> so much of what you talk about having to overcome resonates with me because I know the time period you're talking about. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the bullying you endured in school, I feel it because I know what I went through. Um, and I, and I know what the, the prevailing attitudes at the time were. We didn't talk about this. We didn't, we didn't really have words around our particular experience. So, you know, as I was being beaten and pummeled and called a faggot and called gay and called a sissy often, um, I didn't, there wasn't 
I didn't know how to raise my hand and, and speak up. You know, mm-hmm. that, th- those were the times. So, you know, I've worked through a lot of the, that same stuff. And, and I think a lot of it is a function of the times. I bring that up to say, I think, um, a lot of this has to come from peers, right? So as I see more young people, more, more young men in particular, who are willing to stand up and say, yeah, I love women. Some of them are trans. Mm-hmm. I've had great experiences with them. What are you trying to tell? It says nothing about me other than I love women. Right. Period. And the more of that we see, I think, I think that's where it comes from. It's, it's I think, going to be a function of the times. Does that make any sense? I mean, I think that makes, I, they're not listening. They're... Oh, I was just going to say that makes complete sense to me. I think in the same way, it's never easy to be trans. Like I, I don't think in, in our culture in the last hundred years, there's never been a time that it was easy being trans. Um, it's, it's, it's shifted though in the ways in which it's difficult. And uh, I think just in the way, in the way that a young child who is trans now can express that in ways that I don't think were very possible when like we were kids where largely because the whole society was trans unaware. And I remember having a conversation with my parents after Mm -hmm. I came out to them in my twenties or or actually it was like a little after 30. um, And they were like, well, why didn't you tell us? I'm like, you know what would have happened? I'm like, I didn't Mm -hmm. tell you because I was scared, but if I did tell you, you wouldn't know what to do. You would talk to psychiatrists. They would bring me to some place where they would do gender reparative therapy on me. Like that, that's like what would have happened then. And now things are a little different. And so there's trans awareness. So it's not easy to be a trans kid today, but there's more possibility for trans kids and LGBTQ kids more generally to express themselves. And as that happens, um, it, there's, there's a little bit less stigma. And I, I've heard um, statistics that between 10 and 20% of Gen Z identifies along the LGBTQIA plus spectrum. And right. that's largely because there's a certain amount of, while it's not normal and while it's still hard, uh, there's a, a certain amount of understanding in the population that, well, yeah, well, these people exist, we exist. And as that stigma goes down enough that people can be more readily out, it makes sense that some people will, who maybe aren't along that spectrum themselves, they might be like straight, but they might be like, well, you know, I know trans people and I know trans women and I'm attracted to women. And so trans women are part of the women that I'm attracted to. Um, I think it becomes easier and easier as the stigma goes down. So I, I definitely agree with that. You know, in my thought, <clears throat> excuse me, I spend a lot of time saying, you just know about more of us. More of us are raising our hand. We're not reproducing at a larger rate than we probably ever had. It, we're just telling you. And I think a big part of that, that 10 to 20% is that particularly among men, um, Saying I'm bi doesn't hold the same stigma it did when we were kids. Mm -hmm. I don't know any guy, and I knew a lot of bi guys, but I didn't know any of them that would raise their hand and say so. Yeah, it doesn't hold the same stigma that it held when I came out as bi in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Right, and he, you know, and, and still, of course, Charles... Charles was... Well, he's really gay. I mean, you you actually talk about that in the book. You know, he's... That's what he. That's what he went through. Yeah, definitely. The um, <laughs> I th- there's definitely a lot more. Um, so s- in statistics that like look at the increases of people identifying as LGBTQ now, um, a lot of the increases come from people identifying as bisexual, and this kind of makes sense. So mm-hmm. if you'll remember, uh, um, Kinsley, right? Uh, the Kinsley report. The, the sexologist in the 50s yes. who like just interviewed people about Kin- their sexuality. Kin- Kinsey? Kinsey. 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 Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So like he shocked the world by suggesting 
that like 10% of people weren't exactly straight. And like people freaked out at the time yeah. because like, 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 like that was supposed to be, there were only supposed to be a very, very tiny amount of, of people who were like queer. Right. But like he also had the Kinsey scale. So he was including people who considered themselves a little bit like a little bit left of completely straight. Right. Um, so he would include people like had same sex experiences in his statistics. Right. Mm -hmm. And people were like, no, no, this has to be wildly off. And then everyone convinced themselves like a couple decades later, no, we've, we've done those studies and it's only 2%. It's only whatever. And then it became 5%. And now it's like back to 10. It's like, yeah, because now people mm -hmm. had those experiences of like, they had some same sex experiences, but they also have had some straight experiences. And it's like, now those people can say, oh, I'm bisexual. And you're right that like even 20 or 30 years ago, that there was a lot of, um, of, of shame about being bisexual. And especially I talk about in Sexed Up about the differences in how bisexual women versus bisexual men are, are understood um, by society or misperceived mm -hmm. by society. Yep. And so like the idea is that if you're a bisexual woman, people are like, oh, you're really straight, but just experimenting. And if you're a bisexual man, people are like, you're really gay. And like, it doesn't matter if you've slept uh -huh. with women, you're really gay. And I, I kind of explain uh -huh. how stigma kind of plays a role in that when I go through those chapters. But yeah, so it makes sense that nowadays that there's a big increase in the number of, you know, LGBTQ spectrum people and the people who, when we were kids, would never call themselves anything but straight are now like, okay, it's a little, it's, it's, it's safer for me to right. say that I'm bisexual or with regards to like gender identity, you know, there are a lot of people when, when I came out as trans 20 years ago, I had so many people open up to me, like just people I just saw as like, I would say like cis friends, but I didn't have the word cisgender then that wasn't really being used at the time. But like, I just right. had lots of friends just open up to me about like, yeah, you know, I never really felt like I should be you know, like I never felt fully comfortable with being a man or being a woman, but I don't want to be the other sex, but I feel uncomfortable. And I've always grappled with those, those norms and stereotypes that I'm supposed to be living up to. And so now if you're a kid and you're like my friends, it's like, now you can say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm non-binary. I'm, I'm gender fluid. You, there's language and you can say, oh, okay. So, um, this makes perfect sense to me as somebody who has had a lot of people share their experiences with me because I'm trans and it felt safe for them to do so. I'm not very surprised um, that there's a lot more people identifying as LGBTQ spectrum now compared to what it was like when we were kids and it was really, it was really putting yourself on the line to come out as queer in any way as anything yeah right i mean they they figured they figured it out i can't find <clears throat> the reference somewhere in the early to mid 70s um it had to be phil donahue had a trans woman on the show and i i say it had to maybe i'm wrong but it had to be him because the kid across the street and and we're we're full circle back into the house where I grew up. That's one of the reasons we call ourselves this. So this is the street where it all happened. And he was really, really excited one day because he had seen this show and he said, I know what you are. Mm. And he told me all about this episode and, and what transsexuals were. And he's like, that's what you are. You're just a girl inside a boy. And I went, well, that makes more sense than anything anyone else has called me. <laughs> yeah. And he was, there was no guile in it. There was no, he was like really excited because he had this revelation for me. I was like, oh, I've never told anyone else, but now I do. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it is fascinating. Um, I want to, I want to give you a thought and then we're going to take a quick break. Um, 
but I really do want to talk about these children because you have, you have continued to phrase it. And I appreciate that in a very positive light, because the truth is it is easier to come out. There are a lot more resources. The world in general is more receptive. And yet in this country right now, um, you know, it started with bathrooms, but now we have the Republicans have honed in on trans children and these are horrifying times for them. So I, I'd really like your take on that and, and maybe what we can do about it, but we're going to take a quick break first. Okay. Hello, this is Mama D, and I am the host of Petals of Support. Petals of Support is a podcast that offers advice from a mom to anyone that needs a little extra love and support. This is not advice for moms, but advice from a mom. I've covered such topics as forgiveness, how to forgive, when to forgive, and when it's okay to not forgive, letting go, how to make good decisions, and how to handle stressful situations. I'm not a licensed anything. I'm just a mom that wants to provide to you the same advice that I give my kids, my friends, and my family. You can find me on any podcast platform. You can also find me at Twitter, at Petals of Support. Please go listen, find the episodes that apply to you, and maybe the ones that don't. You can file that information away for later. If you like what you hear, please subscribe. Thank you. And we are back, and we are talking. We are talking to Julia Serrano. Um, let's talk about the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing legislation, primarily in red states. Um, it all follows the theme. It's about us using bathrooms, changing rooms, playing sports. Um, and they're already taking it to, we can't talk about any of us across the spectrum, across the entire LGBT spectrum. So, you know, there are different iterations, but it's all, it feels like the same game. Um, and I, I'm really particularly interested in, in just what your take on this is and, and where I'm really going is what do we tell these kids and their families? Yeah. And yeah, this is very hard. On, on many different levels. Um, like it's hard politically, but obviously the personal and particularly for the kids and families living in these states that are passing this legislation, um, that's, you know, I think it's, it's difficult for me as a trans person seeing these bills being passed and getting really depressed about it. Um, and I can only imagine what it would be like if I was a young trans kid in one of these states that's passing this legislation and the questions that families are having to ask themselves about like you know like what do we do um and i do see people i've seen people callously on social media say well you just got to leave your state and it's like that's not something that mm -hmm. most people can just pick up and, and just move someplace else um i'm sure right. that there right. are the most like affluent um families maybe they can just decide to do that and everything may work out for it but for most of us even if we can't do that like financially like move there's also like there's our community there's for a lot of people like family like that's a lot that to just uproot yourself um so yeah, yeah. because of uh, someone else's bigotry right exactly yeah and then there's also, I feel that right now, I feel like we're in a, a, a situation where there's a lot of just questions about what's going to happen. So what I mean by that is that, A, a lot of these um, bills that are being passed are being challenged in the courts. And, you know, sometimes these things get overturned. Um, sometimes they don't. Uh, there is also right. like, kind of like, uh, I'm trying to think of, I don't want to call it a silver lining, but like when something that's 
good comes out of something that's really horrible. Um, a lot of the state legislatures actually stopped this term working on anti-trans bills because as soon as it leaked that the Supreme Court um, looked, it looks like they're going to overturn Roe v. Wade, a lot of those same states just switched everything over to like um, anti-abortion legislation, which is a horrible, horrible thing. Um, and, you know, there's some respite there. I think that there's a very big political question, which is like what ultimately happens here. And I think a lot of us, I know in my life, talking amongst people I know, and then kind of on social media, like reading what other people are saying, it's like, is this something that, that we can stop? Is this like, are we like literally plummeting into dystopia? Um, and I, I, you know, tend to be, you know, maybe it's naive of me to be too optimistic to think that, oh, we're, we're completely doomed to uh, a handmaiden's tale type future, you know, like whatever dystopia you want to put in there. But it's just like very scary. Um, I think a lot of it, for me, a lot of the questions politically for me involve when will the rest of the country wake up? Um, it feels like the Democratic Party, they haven't really been pushing back against a lot of this anti-trans legislation. Um, they're not anti-trans themselves, but um, I, 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 let me just say this. I saw this, uh, I saw a story that said that GOP lawmakers, so we're in primary season right now, right? Yeah. And um, there are all these political ads that are playing out in different states. And it was like GOP politicians have spent X number of millions of dollars on anti-trans ads that they're running. Like I'm going to be the mm -hmm. candidate who's tough on trans and not a single dollar was spent by any, any Democrat to say, I'm going to stick up for trans people or I'm going to stick up for LGBTQ people. So <laughs> that's mm -hmm. kind of depressing. I, and when I talk to my, I should say my family is very, um, they're kind of very centrist. Like we grew up in the suburbs and they all see themselves as socially liberal um, and they're all accepting of me. Uh, and like when I talk to them about it, I don't think that they're as aware of how bad it is. Like from their, like I'll talk about how bad it's getting and they'll be like, oh, well, I don't think it'll go that far. Um, and they'll say things like, oh, most of the people I know are pro LGBTQ and everything like that. It's like, I'm sure that they're pro LGBTQ to a certain point, but like what happens, like where does that line at which point they actually spend energy fighting it? Um, and so, right. and, and this ties yeah. in with, with abortion, with all of the um, overtly racist um, stuff that's happening, especially like the, the critical race theory legislation that's like outlawing like teachers' ability to talk about the realities of racism in our country and our history. Right, right. Um, right. Like all these things are don't tied say together. Gay, don't say black. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and and these are, are all tied these are all tied together, and they're also tied together with the fact that like you know the January sixth insurrection and like a, a a Republican Party who seems more and more like they might not let <laughs> anyone besides them ever have any control over anything ever again, whether it's the Supreme Court. Right or whether it's state legislatures or whether it's, so it's just a very scary time. And I don't know how that all plays out on a political level. On an individual level, it's also really hard. It's hard for a lot of us who are in marginalized communities as all this is happening to try to, to continue to be a person. And then the level of harm on say a young child where some of this legislation might force you to detransition or force you to come out as trans because nobody you socially transitioned as a very very young child and like people don't know that you're trans like but right. this would force you to i mean it's just 
all this stuff is like really, really horrible. Um, like just beyond even saying it's horrible. Um, it's nightmarish. So, yeah. You know, I, part of it, my hope is that this will be a bridge too far because they are targeting children. And, you know, I, I guess I keep hoping there's enough mothers and grandmothers out there who say, um, yeah, what about these parents? You know, we, we couch things like words don't mean anything. Uh, and we couch things as, as parents' rights. And, you know, that's how they're trying to talk about this nonsense in Florida. But what about the families of trans kids? What about them? And all of it's unconstitutional as far as I can see. And a lot of it is holding in the courts. You know, my fear is this court was designed to overturn Roe. This court was not designed to protect civil rights, but really to abolish them. Right. And I'm just hoping enough people are going to connect the dots that, that these couple of things that are happening right now really are a bridge too far in America. I hope, um, because you know, the foundation of Roe is also the foundation that took away sodom, sodomy laws and gave us contra- the right to contraception and eventually gave us gay marriage. Mm-hmm. You know, and I remember one could argue in 2004, part of why Carrie lost was because there was such a huge campaign against gay marriage. And yet in 2015, we got gay marriage as the law of the land. So I like to say the pendulum swings. I like to say, you know, that that arc arc of progress always bends toward uh, toward civil rights. But it frightens me that, you know, this court could decide not to uphold our civil rights, which is what they're doing with Roe. So it scares me. And I, you know, I think the midterms are going to tell us a lot. If this becomes profitable, if they don't lose too much or they gain through this propaganda they'll continue and and escalate it i think if they really suffer because of it and it'll be some combination of row and and turning the entire trans community into a wedge issue uh, then maybe it'll stop you know that that's just yeah. my sense that's my hope um because one can argue this is backlash to that so even crt i think was backlash to what happened in 2020 when we saw Black Lives Matter on the streets with a whole bunch of white folks marching with them. (laughs) It didn't change how we handle policing in America, but suddenly we have critical race theory, which, you know, is nonsensical and is not a thing, but it's like, there's always this bigger backlash. There's always this outsized response i feel like and and i feel like that's what this is i just i don't know how to say it's going to be okay because i don't know what it's going to be i read an article um recently that the air force is allowing the families of trans children to relocate out of texas they're giving them transfers without um any penalty for that reason yeah so yeah it's a are we all going to move? You know, all of us can't move. Right. All of us can't. And, yeah. uh, but from the perspective, from the research that you've done, the research that, that fuels all of your books, um, give me a little hope from there <laughs> about where we've come from the time we were little trans children to now. How about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can always, I, I like people will always point to when they want to find like a worst case scenario. And, you know, it's easy. And I've, I've been seeing this shared a lot on social media about how one of the things like the Nazi party did, one of the first things they did was they burnt down all the research that was on um, the Institute that that is doing uh the first at least um with regards to like european um within european academia and research um basically the first research showing talking about lgbtq people as we call them now like existing and making their lives better and everything like that and they 
they burnt that to the ground as one of the very first things that they did, right? And so people will share that. And so I don't feel comfortable like just completely ruling that out as one of many of the possibilities that could happen. Having said that, I do think that there a difference between then and now is that there's a certain amount of the genie being out of the box with regards to LGBTQ people where it's it's very clear most people are very aware of the fact that there are actually quite a number of us and they yeah. have they might not have trans people in their lives but they know lesbian gay bisexual people or they know other people who are on the spectrum um and i i don't think you can just completely reverse that knowledge i think Maybe if there's an authoritarian regime that has so much control that you're just, nobody's allowed to talk about that anymore. I don't know what happens then, but like, I think it's hard to get to that point. Like with regards to, so. yeah. Um, yeah. So, and also with, in this country, we have had Excuse me. Um, a history of or at least let's put it this way. While I'm not happy with how journalism often happens or the media often happens here in the US, a lot of people here very, very strongly believe in freedom of speech and everything in, in ways that are sometimes unfortunate where they like excuse, like, you know, the far right saying a lot of disinformation and really, really hateful things, et cetera. But, it's hard for me to imagine that if things got really, really started really going down the line, if, if it crossed a particular line, that there wouldn't be a point that all of these, like, you know, kind of the way like New York Times and other media establishments, they try to both sides everything. It's like, well, you yeah. know, the, right. the, the Republicans and Trump try to like, you know, do an insurrection on January 6th. But at the same time, there are these like, angry leftist mobs on social media who are just as bad, right? That kind of both sides is maybe at a certain point, if it gets bad enough, that enough of them, enough of the nation, because the people who are really pushing this hardline agenda are really, they're about 30% of the country. That's Correct. the 30% of the country that they are largely, you know, white evangelicals. Um, that's 30% if you look at polling about even like kind of the best it's ever been it's dipped down a bit in recent years but like the highest like do you are you pro like lgbtq um even the highest that like people were there's always like 25 to 30 percent of people are like no hate them right. want to get rid of them and yeah. i think that that's that's that same group and these are the people who are animating the republican party right now they you know I, I, I almost said religiously follow Trump, but like they're religious and they follow Trump, um, like just as much. I mean, <laughs> yeah, those words work together. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I think in my mind, there has to be a certain point at which there's a breaking point where enough people are like, enough of this, this can't happen. But there are a lot of wishy-washy people in the center right now um, who I think either don't understand how bad it is or have some kind of self-interest. Like I kind of get the impression that there are a lot of people who, let's say, are very moneyed um, mm. and they don't face marginalization themselves. Maybe they're like, you know, they're, they're white, straight, able-bodied people who kind of will keep voting Republican because they don't want to be taxed too much. But if, if things get to the point where it's really clear that like this, this, this party wants to get rid of a lot of things, not just like sweeping marginalized people under the rug. Like they, they want to get rid of, they want to get rid of some of that free speech and they want to have control, absolute control over people and their lives. So we'll see what happens. I think the obviously like 
you know, no like democratic strategist is going to ask me my opinions about how they should run their campaigns. But I would like to make it really clear that everything that is happening right now is interconnected. All the anti-LGBTQ stuff, anti-abortion stuff, they're going after contraception. The the Lido ruling, the, the opinions he cited, a lot of, I, I'm not a, a law person, but um, a lot of people are like, yeah, you could, they, if, if he gets what he wants, um, states could make it illegal to be in a, um, interracial marriages. They could right. completely eliminate, like they want to eliminate privacy in order to get rid of abortion because abortion is based on privacy, but you could eliminate mm-hmm. privacy, period. No privacy. Right. Like, I think and, people, and, yeah. And they know that they know and he even put in, you know, the writing, well, we're not going after those things. That's settled law. Like now he's saying Overveld is settled. Well, so is Roe. But back in 2020, that's not what you said. Yeah. So, you know, we're playing a game of is he lying now or was he lying then or does he just always lie? Yeah. Well, every and, single one of the, the recent Republican, um, like Kavanaugh, Barrett, um, uh, Gorsuch, like all the recent ones, they they were asked, all of them were asked about Roe, and all of them had the answer, well, Roe versus Wade is, I consider that to be set a law. But supposedly all these justices are on mm. the side, according to the leaked memo, and we'll see what happens when it becomes official, but they all seem to have changed their minds on that. If they're going to change their minds on that, I wouldn't be surprised if they change their minds on other things. Right. You know, I'm going back to the book because I I found a piece of my notes that I can read. (laughs) Um, But, you know, you talked about kind of at the summary toward the end, um, hiding sex. Now, we were talking about sex, of course, but you said it doesn't make sexualization go away. It drives it underground. Um, You know, where an openness to discussing sex, uh, you know, really becomes the answer. Um, <clears throat> but that idea, it's, it's just, it resonated so much because, because so many things are interconnected. And I look at just the puritanism that I still see behind a lot of this language that says to be afraid of us. You know, if we want to limit abortion, we already know sex education will do that. Access to contraception will do that. You don't have nearly as many teen pregnancies when they know what they're doing. Um, yeah, I'm going to say hiding is always worse and it hasn't worked in terms of talking about sex, in terms of talking about autonomy that hasn't worked. Um, so I think a lot of what you say resonates in this conversation. Um, I hope we've, I hope we have laid enough groundwork in being out and being open and saying, we really can talk about these things without destroying one another. The world doesn't fall apart. Um, and I just want to get back to it because it is, I think the lessons that you try to kind of get to here resonate in all, in everything we're seeing right now, because we are seeing such a, a backlash, but I felt hopeful reading, I felt hopeful. You know, sometimes it's good to just know there are like-minded people and <clears throat> you do a really good job at, um, I get snarky sometimes when I'm talking about, you know, some of the folks who talk against us all the time. I really do. And, and you, I think you do a good job of, of saying, let's not do that so much. Let's let's think about the words we choose. Let's think about where people are coming from. Um, and one of the things, Charles, that this you know kind of does is say, as we talk about marginalization, as we talk about, um, you get to the thing where they don't care. I mean, you don't, you don't you say it more eloquently, but the general population does not care about our trauma. It and, and I'm I'm saying it wrong if you want to, you know, jump in, but it doesn't affect them. What the, what, you know, if if we're 1%, what we're going through really doesn't affect the world at large. 
But when we take a different look at sexualization, when we take a different look at what different marginalized people look at, and, and considering that it affects all of us and, and can, can affect all of us more broadly. Did I make any sense right there? Yeah, no, I, 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 I think I, I follow where you're going with that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just the, um, the context in which I bring up uh, hiding sex is it's towards the very end of the book, and it's right after I talk about, mm-hmm. um, particularly a lot of, uh, I have a section where I talk about um, working through like Me Too and um, the reality of sexual assault, um, the difficulty of people coming forward as victims of sexual assault, um, and and the way in which people reacted to Me Too. Um, and so one of the reactions to finding out, oh, all these um, c- celebrities abuse their power um, kind of in their, their workplaces. Um, and a lot of these people are obviously celebrities. Um, yeah, we're, we're familiar with a lot of these stories and a lot of them took place in, in workplaces. And so like, I can imagine for a workplace to say, oh, well, um, what we should do is just like not have any discussion about sex at all in the workplace and everything like that. And that sounds very reasonable. Like I know when I like was working, I didn't necessarily want people like making sexual advances on me or anything like that. So th- there's a, right. a way in which that totally makes sense. But then it's like, oh, well, what if I talk in the book about how marginalized groups are often viewed as excessively sexual for one reason or another? Um, and this is something the way that we're perceived has nothing to do with um, us being more sexual. It has to do with people interpret- interpreting us a particular way. And we can see this with the way in which, you know, um, we see heterosexual couples on the media all the time in movies, like kissing and making out and everything like that. But if you showed like two men, like making out in a TV show, people are like, oh, that's too sexual. That's too much. Right. Right, um, right. people often have, uh, there's a, a longstanding tendency for people to view, um, women of color and particularly like black women as being hypersexual and promiscuous just for things that if, if a white woman did the exact same thing, people wouldn't read it as a sexual thing. Right. Um, mm-hmm. and I talk about this like all throughout the book. And so in a world where people tend to perceive some people as excessively sexual when you say oh we should hide sex what you what you're actually doing is you're disproportionately hurting the people who are viewed as excessively sexual right so like that will disproportionately hurt lgbtq people all the time right um of course uh like one of the examples i use in that section the hiding sex section is how um uh, if you were to walk by a billboard and there was a white, able-bodied, straight woman like wearing like a, a skimpy outfit, you might barely notice it. But if if it was someone who is black and or transgender and or a person with disabilities and or fill in the blank, like like whatever. Um, marginalized groups you want to add to that, like people will view that as sexually inappropriate in a way that they wouldn't if it's a white, cisgender, able-bodied person, right? So we definitely are perceiving and interpreting the world in particular ways. And so the hiding sex strategy will always inevitably hurt the people who are unjustly accused of being excessively sexual to begin with. And this is why I've been very disappointed with some aspects of LGBTQ plus community um, where there have been like a lot of debates about people wanting to like, often it comes up in it's the, the meme is no kink at pride discourse, um, but it doesn't have to be yes. about kink. It could be about anything. Like some of those people will talk about um, people who wear like skimpy outfits or something. Right. Um, mm-hmm when you can like just turn on the TV right now and see like a, a straight woman wearing a skimpy outfit, right? <laughs> like people wear skimpy outfits sometimes. Um, so anyway, I, I was partially talking about that 
Um, I, I think particularly with, with queer communities, we should be really aware of the idea of hiding sex equals hiding LGBTQ people to a certain extent. Um, and I think when I wrote that, I was writing that chapter about a year ago and hopefully um, now with everything that's happened, like literally the, the don't say gay bill, like I hopefully it will start making sense to people that that is when people like want to hide sex, they want to hide LGBTQ people. Right. Oh, absolutely. They do. Absolutely. They do. And, and, you know, it is a difficult conversation to have. I keep having it. First of all, I keep calling the Republicans children's genital fetishists because that's what they're doing. I've never seen so many people so publicly obsessed with the genitalia of small children. I think it's, I think it's a problem. Yeah. They've actually written that in some of their bills, some of their bills, like mm -hmm. especially the sports ones are like that, like actually say that young girls to play on sports teams should have genital checks. I'm not sure if any of those bills passed with that exact language, but some of them had that language in the, the bill. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and who's and that really for? Yeah. Is it, you know, it was interesting. I, I know that it was a meme. I don't know that it was something that actually happened, but in response to don't say gay, there was, the meme propo was proposedly from a, a teacher saying, okay, then we won't talk about gender at all. Now everyone is a they or a them. We are not going to talk about anyone's parents because straight people are having sex and that's sexualizing. If we can't talk about it, then we don't talk about anyone. And it was like, yeah, then let's get to that place because that's the natural extension of what you're saying. Instead of saying, it's okay. You know, um, we, we recently interviewed, um, a trans woman in South Carolina and her wife, and they have a 15 month old daughter and, um, her name is Amberlyn. And she said, my daughter's going to go to school fairly soon. Is she not allowed to talk about her family? Like what comes of this? She has two moms, happy kid, bright kid, everything's good. They're as suburban as it gets. But, you know, her mother is a trans woman. Her other mother is a cis woman and they're together and they're married and they're happy and they have a lovely family. And so, you know, individually, we take the sex out of it. Individually, families that have grappled or, or you know, thought about this understand that everything is age appropriate. It's no different saying, you know, you have two uncles over here and two aunts over there and, you know, a cousin who's non-binary. It's not a big thing. And kids go, oh, OK. Yeah, the, we don't have to get into specifics. So it's perfectly possible where we have the will to do it. It's perfectly possible. I mean, I had a, you know, a conversation with my 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 sister. She said, I, I don't want my granddaughter in a in a changing room with a boy. And I said, well, they don't let boys into the changing room. If you mean a trans girl, I think she, she can handle it. I really do. Have yeah. you ever, I don't know that I've seen you write about that. Do you have, have you had thoughts on that? Cause I, I've, I've had so many people propose compromises and I'm like, I don't see one personally. Yeah. yeah. But, I think generally, so, and I talk about this actually in the first chapter of the book where I do some I, I described some research that exists about how we learn, um, particularly as children, how to like perceive gender um, and to like categorize people according to sex. And all of the research shows that children have a more flexible view generally um, than adults. Like, and children mm -hmm. generally, uh, you know, like children will often like, you know, like role play, you know, being like a different gender, not because they're trans, but like because they're young kids and they have an imagination and th the world isn't as fixed and, and they might not like be ostracized as they might be if they were like a teenage kid who is doing the same thing. And um, so, yeah, so children have a very, a much more flexible view of gender. And with regards to sexuality, like for children, like particularly younger children, 
that's just relationships. Like, no, I've never heard anyone ever, I'm very immersed in like the sex positive world and read a lot of sex educators. I've never heard anybody say, oh, we need to teach young children about like the specifics of how people have sex. Nobody is saying that. Nobody anywhere. Of course. But but people are talking about age appropriate, which age appropriate includes relationships. Children know that there are relationships that, you know, they that people often have, you know, like, you know, a mother and father, but learning that people can have two mothers or two fathers for a child that's not that that's not a difficult thing for them what's difficult is not right, at all. for the adults <laughs> some adults who have problems with it they might feel di it difficult um or they might and especially in a lot of the cases um that we're talking about they might be bigoted and they might want to keep th that information to withhold that information from their child so that in their mind, their child won't turn gay themselves. That's in scare quotes, of course. Right. Um, and I still don't know why they're so. <laughs> yeah, I mean they. They're convinced we're magic. We can just turn people. Yeah, I have. I and do if that have were a... possible, none of us would be queer. Yeah, I think I have a line in Sex Up where I talk about the idea that a lot of people have uh, the assumption that like people can be turned queer like really easy and and the the joke i make in it is something of the, along the lines if uh people could be turned queer by just interacting with us there would inevitably inevitably be queer rogues running around turning people queer willy-nilly by like interacting with them like there would be, be people going around touching Absolutely. people it's like now you're queer now you're queer now you're queer like oh it yeah just, like it doesn't had work. this game of tag years yeah. ago right yeah. <laughs> years ago yeah well it's kind of funny also this is like now it's legislate like, differently yeah it's kind of funny if you flip it around because like so there there will be these straight people worried about oh well what if my child interacts with a trans kid or a gay kid like maybe maybe you know, the, the dreaded social contagion and maybe they'll get it. Right. And it's like, you know, I have so many cisgender heterosexual people in my life and they've mm -hmm. known me my whole life. Some of them are very close to me and I haven't turned a single one of them queer. Like, like I, yeah, I have I know, known, right? I have known a couple people who's like maybe their sexual orientation shifts or maybe I've known them for years and they come out as trans and we have a conversation. They're like, yeah, I wasn't at a point in my life that I was comfortable sharing it. But I haven't turned anyone queer um, insofar as I know. Mm -hmm. And yet, like, <laughs> so it seems really obvious, particularly to us, that this is just a joke, that, 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 that right. we're not contagious. We can't turn anybody anything. But these I ideas persist. And as we talked about earlier, I think a lot of it has to do with kind of our warped ideas about sexuality and stigma. Because right. mm. that theory doesn't say a lot for the durability of heterosexuality now, does it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If it I can mean, be changed that simply. Right. Yeah. I well, mean, and I, that was the argument of, against gay marriage, right? Nobody would want to get regular married if they could be gay married. Like I, they never made sense. You know, it's been law for seven years and no one's dead as a result. I mean, you know, uh, at some point I'm hoping reason takes over at some point. It, it hasn't yet. We're, we're still a good boogeyman. That's, I guess, what gets to me. Um, and do you think that's because we're so small in numbers? Why? When there is so much available in terms of information in the world right now, you can, it's easier than it's ever been to access good information about trans people, to understand, you know, as best one can, to understand what we're about, what our community looks like, what the steps are that we take and why. I mean, there's so much out there. So t to my mind, you've got to want to be ignorant. Why is this working? at all why is it still working yeah i mean i i think there's a mixture of people i mean i think some of them for some people it's very motivated reasoning with regards to 
they have a worldview, they grew up in a worldview and still hold it, that there's only certain ways that you can be in the world and being any other way is some kind of sin or blasphemy of some sort. And so I think that that there's a certain degree of that. I do think that there are some people who are nominally, like they'll, they'll describe themselves as being like pro-gay or pro-trans, but they do feel a little bit uncomfortable about us. Uh, they might even, I talk a bit in the book about just disgust, um, which is a very visceral feeling that people have. And right. which you can, you can have sort of like low levels of disgust toward a person but still interact with them but if you feel like they're getting too close or if there are too many people like that like like if it people will start reacting to it and i've seen that happen with let's put it this way there are some people um who are public people let's say celebrities who seem to have within a number of years gone from being nominally like pro-trans to all of a sudden like just being really, really rapidly transphobic. Um, I don't think that magically mm -hmm. happens. I think that they never, I think that they were barely tolerating us and under the right circumstances, they can kind of all of a sudden express whatever kind of disgust um, they have towards us. Mm -hmm. Um so I, I th and and then also I think that there are a lot of people who genuinely maybe grew up in a world um where they were taught to view people who are LGBTQ as disgusting um but who over the years kind of have has learned to transcend it and they no longer harbor those feelings um I think that there are people at all these different places in the spectrum. I, I specifically talk about this at one point. Um, I think it's a section called destigmatization, um, contagion and disgust, I think is uh, the name of that section mm -hmm. of one of the chapters where I think that there's a spectrum. And I think that there are these different people. There are people who fully stigmatize us. There are people who barely tolerate us. There are people who accept us to a degree like, you know, there are a lot of people who like, oh, I totally accept trans people and you should have all the same rights, but I wouldn't want to date a trans person where someone may be a little bit farther over. Like, well, I tolerate trans people, but I don't want to be in a dressing room with one of them. Um, the people who like think that we should just be banned. Um, we should be morally mandated out of existence as a famous Janice Raymond line yeah. once went. So I think that people are at different places. Um this is why I think a lot of the language, a lot of the activist language, particularly around rights and particularly about acceptance is, and I understand why we think about things in those terms, but sometimes they're a bit inadequate because it's not that people necessarily want to give us rights or take away rights from us. That can be true in some cases, but a lot of times people mm -hmm. have complex feelings about us Sometimes they'll have like ambivalent feelings about us where they want to be a good liberal and be pro LGBTQ, but they also feel a low level sense of disgust about us. And then if trans people like yell about pronouns online, they'll feel attacked about that, even though those people weren't attacking, attacking them, they were talking about an issue. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's very complicated, but I think understanding that people may be coming from different places with regards to us, and so the reactions may be driven by different things. Um, yeah. Okay. At one point, I do you know? I thought of I okay. just thought. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say I just thought I thought of an expression I have not thought of in decades, and my parents used to say this about different people you give them an inch and they'll take a yard oh yeah mm -hmm. and i just i have not thought of that expression in since i was a child but i kind of feel like that's how they look like you know what i was i was fine with us not like killing you or locking you up but but the locker room is too far 
you want yeah. too much. You're asking too much. Yes. Or they, them pronouns. That's too much. Like, I don't understand you people. Like, yeah. like it's an attack on me. You're attacking me by <laughs> some of them. Right. Mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson literally made up a controversy of a Canadian bill that he argued would like could criminalize people if they use the wrong pronouns. And that's not what the law said, but like he turned Jeez, kind of like all. one, one law that would like kind of make it a little bit easier for trans people to exist into a personal attack on me because now I'll be used forced to use your, they, them pronouns. It's just like, and there, that's another part of it. It's like the victimization that has felt a lot, which I think I, I think know. that that's why when you you talked about the the if you give an inch they'll take a yard or whatever like that's kind of it like they have to like they're being attacked now like all these people have to feel like we're the problem and they're the ones who are being attacked and that victimization uh, quality you see it all the time particularly in the like amongst the white Christian nationalists um people mm -hmm. who are acting like we're an assault on them when they're the ones passing legislation against us i was going to say nobody wants to be oppressed more than heterosexual cisgendered white people yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah they do because they need everything <laughs> do you know yeah. i have said and I, and i would just like your take on it. One of the things I've, I have said is our fundamental fight right now, as I see it, is just the notion that we are real. Uh, you know, and you can broaden that to the entire LGBTQ community, but really in terms of the trans argument, they're trying to say we're not even human. They're trying to say our experience of ourselves is not real. And I think they know if they concede that we are, then a lot of this is just cruel. Yeah. I mean, that's I how think, I see it. Yeah. I mean, there's um, a lot of work has been done around um, the concept of dehumanization and particularly looking at how different marginalized groups are often like one step that happens is you're dehumanized. You're viewed as either like, especially there are a lot of metaphors, dehumanizing metaphors that either will compare a marginalized group to like a particular type of animal or um, one that happens a lot with like, for example, the objectification of women, like reducing someone to the status of an object. Um, but in either mm -hmm. case, it's like kind of wiping out your humanity and then you become just a thing that they can stomp out or exploit or whichever. Um, so I, I definitely think that there's something to that. And, and, and I also agree, thinking back to when I transitioned 20 years ago and a lot of the reactions I got, and I got a lot of positive reactions, like most people I know um, were various levels of accepting. Um, but occasionally I would get people who would just like be like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to go along with your delusion. Like I would occasionally get something like that, not from the people closest to me, but from some people. And, mm -hmm. but I do think that there are a certain amount of people who are like, oh, well, some people transition, live and let live, whatever, if that's, th that they probably think of it as delusion. They probably think that we're not real, um, but they'll go along with it because, you know, they're just, they're, they're being nice. They're doing us a favor in their minds. And, uh, I think especially once there are a lot of trans people and we're talking about our realities, then they can have the experience of feeling like it's too much, like, you know, and, and the, the delusion language, you see it all the time in like gender critical slash turf rhetoric. Um, you know, mm. they'll talk about, you know, people being brainwashed by gender ideology. Um, I had someone describe, I was really confused by a comment. Um, and then I saw that someone was like, a, 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 this was on Twitter. And I saw that they were like a gender critical person. Like their whole feed was anti-trans stuff. 
And um, I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. okay, this weird thing they said to me that I couldn't understand makes sense because they're talking to me as though I've been like brainwashed into a cult. Okay, now now I understand like where that weird comment that didn't make any sense to me came from. But yeah, I, I do think right. for a lot of them, recognizing us as real is a threat because if we are real and they continue to want to inflict harm on us or to make our lives miserable, then they are doing that to a person rather than some figment of their imagination. And I, I think it applies to the TERFs as well, to the gender critical crowd as well. It, it baffles me. It, a lot of it hurts because I, I know at least a couple folks who ascribe to a bit of this and these are brilliant lesbian feminists that have been in the fight for decades and decades who now look at trans women and reduce us and trans men too and and that's a lot of their issue um we're they're reducing us to genitals they're saying at, at least that's the way i'm viewing it like isn't this everything you always fought against? Why, why is this coming up now? I mean, I know it's not new in some circles, but it really has taken flight in a way I don't understand. Yeah, I in Whipping Girl, I have a chapter called "Bending, um, Bending Over Backwards," I believe, that specifically is about this. And the the title comes from the fact that, and and I was writing this in the mid two thousands. Um, and a lot of this rhetoric mm -hmm. at the time, there was no social media. We had internet, but not social media. But a lot of this was coming out of, uh, specifically with regards to like the Michigan Women's Music Festival, which used to have a women born women only policy that excluded trans right. women. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. I, I, I took every argument that I could find and I pointed out how each and every one of them is anti-feminist. Like if you just like step back, um, and you just look at it, it's like a lot of these are all about like biology is destiny, which is the exact same argument that like patriarchal people use to put down women. That it's like, well, you know, women are just not as good at technology and making serious decisions as men. It's like kind of the same thing. You mentioned genitals. Like it's like I, no woman wants to be reduced to her genitals, but like you're going to do that to me now. Um, you know, like a lot of mm -hmm. it is about judging people like, oh, well, I don't want to go into this bathroom with this person because they obviously look like a man. Um, and it's like, like, you know, like, or, or, or in whatever way, it's like, kind of like, you mean we don't look like real women? Like that, that line that like, oh, you're not a real woman because you don't do X, you don't dress this way, you don't act this particular way, you're not a right. real woman living up the patriarchal standards of what women should be. It's like, there are a lot of the exact same arguments. Um, they're just used slightly differently. And it's a shame that people, um, it's a shame that particularly that feminists would buy into those arguments. Um, but uh, again, if if you have really strong feelings, bigoted feelings, or feelings of disgust towards trans people, then a lot of times people aren't driven as much by, they're not making the most rational argument, they're just making the argument that gets them the, 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 the answer that they can use, that they want to use to like exclude somebody. Right. Right. Yeah. It, I, you know, we keep saying it isn't pie. It isn't pie. You know, sharing this planet doesn't have to be like that. Just, you know, allowing for the dignity of trans women doesn't, doesn't, as far as I can see, and certainly doesn't need to take anything away from a community of cis women at all. At all. Yeah. And, and, you know, in the same way, trans men take nothing away from. I'm the one saying, let's all just live and let live. And y'all are finding reasons why we can't. That's, right. it's, I don't know. I don't know. You, um, 
you have helped me so immensely like grapple with these things. That's why, I, you know, I, I tried to ask you questions in a way that, um, that I hope showed that. Um, but you did, you've taught me so much about being able to think about femininity and being trans in this world. And, you know, that we all don't have to be the same or fit any particular mold. And I gravitate so much through the cacophony to a voice that speaks always lucidly with clarity and with such humanity. And that is how I always find your writing. Well, so first off, thank you for being on the planet. And I know that we've, yes. we've gone over the time uh, that we asked you for, because I could talk to you all night. <laughs> um, Julia, I, I, the new book is sexed up. It is fantastic. Um, what is the best way to buy it? The best way to buy it. Um, I always encourage people, if they can, yeah. to go to to your uh, your local independent bookstore because uh, it's been a difficult time for them generally. But then with COVID, even more so, as people have gotten even more into the habit of um, ordering stuff online than even before. Um, so if you can go to your, your local bookstore, right. if they don't have it, you can just say, "Can I order it?" They will order it for you. And when they place that order, they might order some books uh to put on their shelves too knowing that people are interested in it um so that's the best way and if mm -hmm. if you can't afford it you can also do the same thing for your library say i'm interested in this book and um encourage them to order it and uh, i've already gotten some messages from people who did that for their library which is great um but if you I have a preferred it. online outlet or etc if you go to my webpage juliasarena.com um, and then click the button for the sexed up webpage. And I have links there to my publisher, Seal, Seal Press. And uh, for hard book, mm -hmm. um, for hardcover, ebook, and audiobook, um, you can click that and they list a whole bunch of different outlets. So then from there, you can just pick your favorite. So those are multiple ways that you can okay. order this. Wonderful. Book. And we'll put those links in the details of this episode and also in our link tree, link tree slash full circle the pod. We will. We will. Great. And uh, your writing can also be found uh, on medium.com. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. That's where I find your, it, right? Yeah. And uh, I also. Anything else coming up? I should also say that if on my regular website, juliasarena.com, if you go to my writings page, I actually very, very um, detailed chronicling of every article um, that I put out. Most of them are online. So you can go through like many, many years of, of writings uh, from there. And a lot of my recent stuff is on Medium. So Fabulous. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I cannot thank you enough for being with us, um, truly. And I thank you always for being just such a, an important voice of clarity in our community. It's, this has been an honor for me very much. Well, thank you for those kind words. And I'm very, was very happy to have this conversation with you and had a wonderful time doing it. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, this has been Full Circle, the podcast. I'm Martha Mandrigal. <laughs> and I'm Charles Tyson, Jr. Thank you for joining us. Full Circle is a Never Square Productions podcast, hosted by Charles Tyson Jr. and Martha Madrigal, produced and edited by Never Scurred, executive produced by Charles Tyson Jr. and Martha Madrigal. Our theme and music is by the Jingle Berries. All names, pictures, audio, and video clips are registered trademarks and or copyrights of their respective copyright holders.